Well, I learned this morning at 8.15 that Carol wasn't going to be here. And having spent many, many years in this church, and already scheduled to be worshipfully here, I said, well, okay, I'm speaking. <laughs> God is still speaking, one of the United Church of Christ uh, anthems. And I, I read our scriptures again, and I understand why, I believe I understand, why Carol chose Isaiah, most of chapter 58. And if you look at the front of your bulletin, she has specifically given us the words, part of the words from Isaiah 58, verse 10. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Amen. So, it's about justice and it's about taking care of those who have less. And it's about spreading the joy of God's message and not spending any time, not wasting any time, uh, putting people down, talking like you're the greatest when they feel that it's an arrogance. It's about listening for the voice of God and the words of God. So I, I suppose all of us that have had similar examples. This week I'm just kind of doing my thing, walking around, and I spotted this couple that was interracial. And somehow the first thing that blitzed through my mind was not a kind, warm, godly, Jesus taught thought. And I thought, <laughs> why, why did, first I apologized to me and to God and to the people, and I thought, why, where did that come from? I, you know, I, I do my best to try to be a person who feeds the hungry and takes care of those who are, who are poor and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. I, I, I feel pretty confident most of the time that I, I, I can see the light that Isaiah talks about in this just one verse. So, I had to ponder that one. I'm still pondering it. Um, things like that happen more frequently than I would like. I hear some little voice from somewhere coming with not a God sound, not a God wink. And I, I don't suppose I'm the only person in the room who struggles from that sort of thing. It, it just kind of happens. And it makes me wonder, it makes me ponder. So I kept reading this scripture both through the week and again this morning, and it became clear to me that we have a lead, a value, almost a commandment, to continue to change our lives, to, to struggle, to make a difference on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. And that light will then rise in the darkness and the night will become like noonday. Carol was, I think, really troubled that she couldn't be here this morning. She printed out information for me that she calls a short sermon and I will try not to chat on and on. It's, it's um, based on People through history who have made a difference. People through history who teaches us if we'll stop, take a look, listen, and think about it. The first is William Booth. He embarked upon his ministerial career in 1852, desiring to win the lost multitudes of England to win them to Christ. 
He walked the streets of London to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the poor, the homeless, the hungry, and the destitute. Just my thought. He should maybe also have included all those society people in London at the time. Booth abandoned the conventional concept of church and pulpit, instead taking his message to the people. This fervor led to disagreement with church leaders in London who preferred traditional methods. As a result, he withdrew from the church and traveled throughout England, conducting evangel evangelistic, evangelistic meetings. His wife, Catherine, could accurately be called a co-founder of the Salvation Army. William Booth, Salvation Army. In 1865, William Booth was invited to hold a series of evangel evangelistic meetings in the East End of London. He set up a tent on a Quaker graveyard and his services became an instant success. This proved to be the end of his wanderings as an independent traveling evangelist. His renown, his, his renown as a religious leader spread throughout London and he attracted followers who were dedicated to fight for the souls of men and women. Thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, and drunkards were among Booth's first converts to Christianity. To creations who were desperately poor, he preached hope and salvation. His aim <coughs> was to lead people to Christ and link them to a church for further spiritual guidance. Many churches, however, did not accept Booth's followers because of their past. So Booth continued giving his new converts spiritual directions, challenging them to save others like themselves. Soon they too were preaching and singing in the streets as a living testimony to the power of God. In 1867, Booth had only 10 full-time workers, but by 1874, the number had grown to 1,000 volunteers and 42 evangelists, all serving under the name The Christian Mission. Booth assumed the title of the general superintendent with his followers calling him general, Known as the Hallelujah Army, the converts spread out over the east end of London into neighboring areas and then to other cities. Booth was reading a printer's proof of the 1878 annual report when he noticed the statement, the, mission, the Christian mission is a volunteer army. Crossing out the words volunteer army, he penned in Salvation Army. From those words came the basis of the foundation deed of the Salvation Army. From that point, converts became soldiers of Christ and were known then, as now, as Salvationists. The Reverend Charles Zetta Waddles, known as Mother Waddles, spent nearly four decades of her life devoted to, devoted to providing aid and inspiration to disadvantaged people in Detroit, Michigan. Born, born Charles Zetta, Lena Campbell, October 7th, 1912, in St. Louis, Missouri, Waddles was a natural caregiver as the eldest of seven children. Soon after, her father passed away, and with her mother in poor health, she dropped out of school at the age of 12 to help support her family. Her experience with poverty as a child heavily influenced the course of her later life and work. At the age of 36, Waddles began her crusade against poverty while her husband supported her and their 10 children. After learning that her neighbor with two children was going to lose her home, Waddles collected donations of food and money to assist her. She soon followed this act with numerous other selfless acts of charity to help other disadvantaged people. In the late 1940s, Waddles began holding prayer meetings in her home for small groups of women whom she encouraged to join her cause by performing practical acts of charity. During this period, Waddles was involved in diligent Bible study and she eventually became ordained as a minister in the First Pentecostal Church. Later, she was reordained in the International Association of Universal Truth. In 1950, Waddles founded the Helping Hand Restaurant in Detroit's Skid Row, 
where she offered meals for as little as 35 cents. The restaurant was finally kept with uniformed servers, white tablecloths, and a flower on each table. All those who could not afford to pay for their meals were allowed to eat for free. Initially, Waddles did all of the cooking, dishwashing, and laundry herself, but eventually dozens of dedicated volunteers assisted her. In 1984, the restaurant was forced to close its doors because of a fire. In 1956, Waddles was able to convince an inner city landlord to let her use vacant storefront space at no cost. At this property located in a crime-ridden area of Detroit, she established the Mother Waddles Perpetual Mission for saving souls of all nations, later shortened to the Mother Waddles Perpetual Mission. The mission faced many challenges over the years, including fires and financial setbacks, but its spirit and goals remained constant. Thousands of disadvantaged people made use of the mission. As many as over 200 volunteers were available to provide assistance. Through the mission, Waddles offered a free medical clinic, job counseling, and placement, as well as several innovative programs that included classes in typing, dressmaking, machine operation, upholstery, and cooking. To this day, the mission still serves the low-income communities of Detroit and provides assistance to approximately 90,000 people annually. Hmm. Clara Barton, as one of the nation's premier humanitarian organizations, the American Red Cross is dedicated to helping people in need throughout the United States and in association with other Red Cross networks throughout the world. We depend on the many generous contributions of time, blood, and money from the American public to support the life-saving services and programs. Clara Barton and a circle of her acquaintances founded the American Red Cross in Washington, D.C. on May 21st, 1881. Barton first heard of the mission of the Swiss-inspired Global Red Cross Network while visiting Europe following the Civil War. Returning home, she campaigned for an American Red Cross and for eradication of the Geneva Convention protecting the war injured, which the United States ratified in 1882. Barton led the Red Cross for 23 years, during which time we, they conducted the first domestic and overseas re disaster relief efforts aided the United States military through the Spanish-American War and campaigned successfully for the inclusion of peacetime relief work as part of the Global Red Cross Network, the so-called American Amendment that initially met with some resistance in Europe. Ruth Ellis. 1899 to 2000. Ruth Ellis lived in Detroit from 1938 until her death in 2000. She opened her home to the community on the weekends as a safe place from the 1940s through the 1960s, a time when American, American, African American gay men and lesbians had few social ventures. Ruth also personally assisted young people with money for college books and food. She unselfishly gave everything that she had to, to whomever needed it. In the 1970s, Ruth moved into senior housing. Through a chance meeting in a self-defense class, Ruth made a connection to a group of younger women who embraced Ruth's courage and pioneering efforts in living a happy life amid great adversities. The Ruth Ellis Center, incorporated in 1999, is a youth social services agency with a mission to provide short-term and long-term residential safe space and support services, services for runaway, homeless, LGBTQ youth. As LGBTQ youth continue to be dis disproportionately affected by homelessness, 
the Ruth Ellis Center remains dedicated to ensuring that these vulnerable youth and young adults receive the services and inherent protections available to all citizens. While the center emphasizes serving LGBTQ youth who are often ostracized, shamed, and denied services by other agencies, no youth, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation, is turned away or denied services. Ruth Ellis Center currently operates four core services. One, residential housing program, Ruth's House. Two, Second Stories Drop-In Center, providing low barrier access to safety net services like food, clothing, showers, laundry, and case management. Three, Second Stories Outpatient Mental Health Services. And four, Family Group Decision Making through the application of positive youth developmental programming, facilitating psychoeducational peer support groups, restructuring mentoring programs, and the provision of core and adjunct services, either on-site or through referrals. We seek to provide life-enhancing and life-sustaining services designed to improve the health outcomes of the homeless LGBTQ youth and encourage thriving behavior. Isaiah 58 teaches us what we are to do each day of the week, and Hebrews reinforces this teaching. Chapter 58 of Isaiah is the foundation for many helping charities and social outreach justice ministries in the world. It is also the foundational scripture for the social justice and outreach ministries of the United Church of Christ denominationally. We are to reach out on all days, not just on fasting or non-fasting days. There is work to be done every day of the week. What do William Booth, Clara Barton, Ruth Ellis, Reverend Charles Zeta Waddles, and members of this con congregation have in common? I would guess that none of the people set out to create ministries they, they created, but they heard the message in Isaiah 58 and the message in the teaching of Jesus Christ that healing 